Thank you very much, uh, and good morning. Um, I'm Peter Francis, as introduced, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the work we're doing at Ray Therapeutics. Um, and Ray Therapeutics was um, uh, formed in 2021 uh, with a mission to restore vision to patients with retinal degenerations. Um, we are a, an optogenetics, a visual optogenetics company. And our key differentiator um, in our lead asset is that for the first time we have a truly bioengineered optogenetic medicine which has been optimized uh, for human vision. Until this time, almost all of the other optogenetic approaches have used wild type proteins. This one has been specifically optimized to, to, to improve vision to the maximum effect. Uh, and we're seeing that in our preclinical studies, that um, we're able to restore higher visual function, such as measures of visual acuity, contrast sensitivity, field and motion vision. Uh, and moreover, our optogenetic approach should be active in normal lighting. So uh, many other approaches have needed the use of light enhancing eyewear. Uh, we hope not to need uh, that. Um, we're based in the uh, uh, Berkeley area, in the, in the Bay Area of San Francisco. Um, and we have a very experienced management team. Um, back in May, we were successful in raising a $100 million Series A, um, uh, led by a, a world-leading uh, venture capital uh, syndicate. Um, and um, I think it reflects uh, an investment in what we consider to be a, a de-risked uh, development program. Um, we aim to be a first to market uh, in optogenetics. Uh, in, in large populations um, of patients, uh, and we're using a, uh, our optogenetic optimized protein uh, via a simple intravitreal injection, an AAV-based gene therapeutic, which can be delivered at low dose uh, and, and is, uh, appears safe. So just to orient ourselves a little bit on where visual optogenetics can fit in to the treatment algorithm um, that's, that's becoming that we're aware of um, for retinal degeneration. So on the, on the top half of the slide is a cross-section schematic of the retina. Uh, and for the most part, most retinal degenerations, even macular degeneration, progress in this similar fashion with the loss of the, the top layer of cells, the photoreceptors, uh, and they don't regenerate. Um, the primary cell that you're left with is the retinal ganglion cell. And um, for that reason, that's where we're targeting first. Uh, moreover, we're looking to improve vision um, by stimulating those surviving retinal ganglion cells. So, so optogenetics really fits into a niche in this treatment algorithm that aren't really covered by the other approaches. The other approaches like gene replacement therapy, gene editing, are fantastically exciting, um, but they really require you to have those photoreceptors present for, the, for them to have a, a significant visual benefit. Uh, and so optogenetics fits into treating patients for whom there really is no uh, treatment likely, uh, the advanced group of patients. Uh, and the other nice thing about it is that we don't need to treat patients based upon their, their genotype. So when we talk about treating patients with retinitis pigmentosa, we have the possibility of treating all comers with all genetic mutations, as I'm sure you're, many of you are aware, there may be up to 100 different individual genes that cause that particular uh, disease. So this is a snapshot of our pipeline, our lead asset RTX015, our optogenetic protein crown. Um, we're late stage preclinical development. Our lead indication is retinitis pigmentosa. There's some idea of the populations that could be treated. These are the treatable populations, not the total population with these, with these diseases. We do have a second program, RTX 015, which we're actually equally excited about. From a technology perspective, it's a real major advance, and I think it could allow us to treat patients with a uh, uh, large market indication like geographic uh, atrophy. A few words about optogenetics itself. It is um, a, a disruptive technology. It's been around actually for about 20 years, as you'll see from the next slide. Um, it's built around the identification in, um, in, in single cell microbes uh, that they have an ability to move towards light. And the way they do this is they've evolved a unique transmembrane protein, uh, a channel rhodopsin, which is unique in the fact that it is light gated. So the channel opens and closes to direct illumination. What optogenetic uh, researchers have done is said, well, if we can 
activate uh, this channel using light, we could express that in neurons, and then using light, we could actually stimulate those neurons. And it's proven seminal in mapping diseases and uh, brain circuitry and so on and so forth in the brain. And this is a simple transfer, if you like, of that um, uh, uh, intellectual idea uh, into the retina, which is essentially a, a multi-layered neuronal structure. And in this way, light coming inside the eye can stimulate these channel rhodopsins, activate these neurons. And multiple independent laboratories, including ours, have demonstrated that this can uh, result in a formed visual signal and um, can stimulate um, uh, a, a visual signal. Obstetrics has been around for about 20 odd years. It's really coming of age, you know, and I think now we're seeing more and more bioengineered, optimized optogenetic proteins for multiple uses, and we've been able to harness that for vision restoration. Um, it's now about six or seven years since the first treat patients with optogenetics, were, sorry, were treated with optogenetic therapy, and many of those trials still continue. Broadly speaking, it's shown to be safe, and the other thing that we like about it is that in clinic, it's pretty clear that multiple programs have shown some degree of visual improvement with optogenetics. So that the technology as a whole works. What we really need now is hopefully what we have, which is something which is optimized uh, for vision so we can realize uh, the, the true potential of optogenetics to restore vision uh, to, to patients with visual um, uh, disability. So to, to reiterate, RTX015 really approaches the same sensitivity as the, as the opsins in your retinas that you're looking at the screen with. Um, it has a broad wavelength of activation in the visible range, and it retains a very large dynamic range, so bright to dim lighting, uh, and it retains fast switching for uh, dynamic vision. So we expect it to be active as described there. It is, as I've said, an intravitreal aav based chain therapy going for those retinal ganglion cells that survive later to the disease process. We expect, because it's visual improvement and the, the kinetics of gene expression, that we'll see early efficacy. And because we're hoping to see um, uh, higher visual function restoration, this should be in approvable uh, endpoints. Uh, I've made a case for the fact that uh, we should have a large market, indica uh, large market to, go, to go and treat. Uh, and because it's ophthalmology, low doses, low cost of goods of manufacturing, and uh, a readily available uh, compa commercial comparator in Lux Turner, which is the only approved uh, gene therapy for a very small number of patients with retinitis pigmentosa. So, you know, what of our, what of our particular data? Um, we've used the, what has now become the gold standard um, uh, model system, which allows us to look at multiple visual parameters. Um, and we're able to do head-to-head -head comparisons um, in this model between us and um, other optogenetic proteins. So this is some of the data. So um, uh, the early first generation shown with number one here show very low levels of light sensitivity. They need a lot of bright light to be activated. 1E16 is like bright sunlight. Uh, 1E13 is um, down at sort of dim street lighting, and that's where we are with our crown optogenetic protein. And when we compare with all the others that are currently in the clinic, we're at least 100 to 1,000 fold more light sensitive uh, than, than these, uh, uh, these competitors, if you like. Um, and once again, we can calculate where you'd need to use those light enhancing goggles. Uh, and, and we're the only ones that are sort of above that threshold. We won't uh, need to use those. When we look at higher visual functions, and this is really now important for human vision, you know, is there a possibility of restoring visual acuity, contrast sensitivity? That's a massively important aspect of, uh, of vision. Um, for the first time, and this is really what we essentially formed the company around, was for the first time we're actually seeing these higher visual functions appear. So untreated uh, animals have no responses. We don't see that with the first generation optogenetic proteins either. Compared with um, the normally sighted animals, um, we're getting about 50% um, visual creation, visual acuity. You'd appreciate these animals have never seen before. So this is new vision to them. Um, and so quite remarkable improvement. Uh, and then when we look at contrast sensitivity, almost near normal levels of contrast sensitivity have been, have been restored. So, we hope to think that we are experienced drug developers as well, so based upon this data, which shows the exciting translational potential, uh, we've really been able to, to advance this as a drug product. Um, we've been delighted with the uh, relationship we have with Forge Biologics, so we're moving forward with that manufacturing process. Um, which suits very much the ophthalmology imp ap applications in terms of the scale that we're at right now and so on. Um, our clinical development program is, is, um, is 
as much as we can tell, as de-risked as you can make it. We're relying on a simple intravitreal delivery, which is done a thousand times every, uh, every day in the United States, simple office procedure. We're able to go at low dose, so reducing those risks that we've seen uh, of inflammation when it comes to AAV-based gene therapy in the eye. Um, we have a really nice advantage in that the safety population for an early phase development is actually the same population that should benefit from the treatment. So we do have the realistic possibility of seeing visual improvement in a phase 1-2 program. Obviously, we would go into this disease population with therapeutic doses. Um, uh, and our efficacy is also attractive. As I mentioned, looking for improvements in vision. Statistically, that's um, you know, much easier to detect, but also uh, much more important for patients if we can actually restore vision to these, to these poorly sighted individuals. We expect early endpoints, so early readouts, uh, which give us an opportunity for proof of concept um, in a very attractive time. And once again, in terms of drug development, um, we're able to leverage, we think, uh, measures which are fully approvable by the US FDA, uh, which simplifies your development program uh, and accelerates things through uh, to, to, the, to the end. So we at Ray hope that we are going to realize the full potential for optogenetic vision restoration with a substantial improvement in, in quality of life for those patients for whom there are currently no therapies and they're suffering from uh, irreversible retinal blindness. Uh, and with that, I'll say thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take um, any questions. And there's no issue if there are no questions. I guess we covered it. Oh, sorry. Yes, there is one. Hi. Uh, could you share your plans? Uh, when are you planning to go in the clinic? Um, we are late stage preclinical at the moment, and um, uh, early part of next year is when we're planning our first clinical trials um, in the United States. Um, this is, a, this is a, a rare disease, our first indication in, in, in retinitis pigmentosa. So we anticipate the need for a phase one, two program, and then, and then most likely a single global phase three program. Um, and so we're, we're already sort of making preparations in anticipation of that. Thank you very much indeed. Happy to answer any questions when I'm out on the floor. Have a good day.